Good morning and welcome to our first class of History of the Black Experience with Vice President Leonard Moore. I am Helen Warmington, Executive Director for the Office of the Vice President in the Division of Diversity and Community Engagement and the moderator for this class series. Uh, first of all, um, all attendees will be muted and your video will be off. Uh, please keep in mind that this webinar will be recorded and will be available on our Division of Diversity and Community Engagement website. This webinar, webinar it will also be closed captioned, so in case you want to read along, it is available on your menu bar. Dr. Moore will be answering questions throughout the class. You may submit questions via the Q&A tab on your Zoom menu screen. Questions will be answered that are relevant to what Dr. Moore will be discussing in class. You are welcome to vote up a question if you feel it's one that you want answered. The chat room will be open during programming. Please be mindful and respectful of the space. Um, again, questions will be answered through the Q&A tab and not through the chat room space. Dr. Moore, take it away. All right, folks, good morning. Hope y'all are doing well. Hope everybody is uh, staying safe. They say the number of cases is going up. Uh, you know, you know, wear a mask if you can. Oh, excuse me, a more uh, politically correct term is a face covering if you can. Um, uh, but we are definitely, you know, uh, in the middle of a pandemic and I hope you all are, are, are staying safe. I hope your family and your loved ones uh, are doing well. Thank you for, for joining in. This is sort of a dress rehearsal for me. Uh, this will be my 23rd year as a professor and I was notified a couple weeks ago that both of my classes uh, will be online this summer. So I have to get used to looking at a small webcam as opposed to looking out uh, at a room of four to 500 uh, awesome UT students from all backgrounds from uh, things of that nature. So it, it, it is an adjustment. So uh, I'm doing my best to stay looking at the camera and not look at uh, not look at my laptop. So thank you again. Before I begin, I, I just want you to know that, you know, uh, I'm excited that there is so much interest in the subject matter. And, and, and but I want you to take it further than this. I mentioned uh, on the webinar a couple weeks ago that, you know, we have a vibrant uh, African and African diaspora studies department chaired by Dr. Sheree Smith. And they basically teach and research on all areas of, of black life, culture, history, literature, gender, uh, sexuality, uh, uh, yeah, people doing research on black folk and data and statistics. So understand as a faculty or staff member that resource is available to you um, to order the class, to go sit in on the class. And also Dr. Peniel Joseph has the Center for the Study of Race and Democracy. Dr. Joseph just published a book on Martin and Malcolm in America. And he has pro a lot of vibrant programming throughout the year. And then uh, lastly, the history department, which I am a uh, member of, you know, we have a lot of offerings on African American history uh, every academic year as well. And beginning September 1, Dr. Dinah Berry will be chair of the history department, and she's probably the nation's foremost expert on, on slavery. So we have a lot of experts on the campus. Uh, so again, make yourself, make those, avail yourself to those resources if you, if you want more. All right, let's get to it. So I'm uh, from Cleveland, Ohio. I always tell people where I'm from. I think that's a big part of me. I went to school at Jackson State University, uh, HBCU in Jackson, Mississippi, left there in 1993 and got a master's degree at Cleveland State University and then went on and got a PhD uh, at Ohio State. I think I was born to be a history teacher. Black history is the only thing that I've ever loved. Uh, it's a passion of mine. In fact, that I get, that I get paid to do it. Um, makes it even even more rewarding. My, my professional life has been uh, tremendously blessed. Also about me, I'm married. My wife, Thais Moore, works on campus. She directs the Fearless Leadership Institute, uh, an organization, a student group for uh, African-American women. And I have the, I'm the father of three teenagers. I have a 17-year-old uh, who sleep, a 16-year-old who sleeps about four o'clock every day. And then my son is, uh, is a, a 14. So that is somewhat a little bit about me. Um, I have published several books on African-American history, primarily in the area of black politics. Uh, so I have a little Google page, a little Amazon page if you want to check it out. And right now I'm working on another project. It's sort of a family history to an extent. It, it deals with the lynching of Jerome Wilson, a family relative who was lynched in Washington Parish, Louisiana in 1935. And you, you Google Jerome Wilson lynching, New York Times, the article uh, will pop up. A distant relative of my mom, 
Um, the Wilsons lived about one tenth of a mile from where my mom's parents lived. So it's been a good story for me, just retracing some of the, the history of our family uh, through this 1935 lynching in many ways that became a, uh, a national story. So that is sort of uh, what I'm working on right now. Many of you have seen the news recently with a lot of the debates over the Confederate statues. Those, the Confederate statue debates remind me that we haven't done a good job of teaching black history at all. And like I mentioned on the webinar, many Americans have what I call a civil rights framework for looking at current race relations. Many well-meaning people believe that once the legal barriers to voting um, and integration in many ways were, were handled, they feel as if in many ways the playing field has, has been level since 1968. And that is a big misconception. And we'll try to jump into some of that uh, over the next uh, four or five weeks. I believe in the power of teaching. I remember when I was a graduate student at Ohio State and they gave me my first class. It was American history class, a modern US history class. And I was excited. Uh, I taught it like on Tuesday nights for three hours. It was my own class. I felt like a, a junior professor. And I remember now Ohio State, the winter quarter starts in January. It goes from January to March, their own quarters. And I remember the first day of class, a, a young uh, man walks into class. He has on a tank top and he has a big old Confederate flag tattoo on his, on his bicep. And every Monday night, that student came in there. I don't know if he was trying to intimidate me or what, with the Confederate flag tattoo, basically letting me know what his politics what were about. But at the end of those 10 weeks, the young man comes up to me with tears in his eyes. And he said, um, Mr. Moore, I never knew this about the Black experience. He said, I want to apologize to you for coming in here every day and uh, showing you my tattoo. And so I really believe in the power of teaching. I believe uh, the more we know about people's backgrounds and histories, I think we, we can, in many ways, get through some of the racial issues we have going on in contemporary uh, America. Now, let me say this, folks. We, we can't run from learning. We, we can't run from it. I was talking to somebody, and I was telling this person they need to take uh, Dr. Gordon's racial geography tour of UT. And several people have told me, well, Leonard, I don't want to take the tour. I'm like, why not? It's because some people don't want to know the history. And, and as a historian, not only do we tell the good of history, but we have to tell the ugliness of history. And sometimes we got to sit in that ugliness and process it. But we can no longer run from getting knowledge or well, I don't want to learn about that. I even tell my kids sometimes, well, daddy, I don't want to watch another movie about slavery. No, you need to expose yourself to it so we can really understand uh, um, uh, American history in many ways, uh, the good, the bad, uh, and the ugly. One of my best experiences, I would say, as a professional came when I went to the Holocaust Museum in DC. Now, I grew up in a half black, half Orthodox Jewish community, east side of Cleveland, Ohio, grew up with a lot of Orthodox Jews, understood the Holocaust, but I didn't really understand the full impact of that experience until I went to the museum in Washington, DC. And I really believe to this day, I am the only person who read, who has read every word in that museum. And when they closed up, I really, I wanted to stay longer. I asked the manager, I said, well, can you all just give me the key and I'll close up uh, when I leave? But history can be impactful and it is designed in many ways to change attitudes, to change perceptions and also to change uh, viewpoints. Um, you all should have gotten a copy of the syllabus and this is the prettiest syllabus you will ever see. I believe, you know, my typical syllabus is is one page all black and white, bad formatting and all that. Um, but we have some good books on the syllabus. The first book is Lynch Law in Georgia. It is a collection of first person articles from the Atlanta, from Atlanta newspapers dealing with lynchings in the 1880s and 1890s. Some of them are very graphic, but I need to put that on the syllabus because I want us to understand the history of racial violence in the US. And I think when you read some of these first person narratives of what it was like to see an African-American get lynched. I think it will let us know that there is a long history of racial violence in America. The second book, Negroes with Guns, and what's funny when I signed that book in my class, um, you know, particularly white students go pick up the book, they're often, and I ask them, you know, uh, what did your roommate say when they saw the book? <laughs> and some of them say, well, my roommate got kind of scared and like, oh, are you becoming a radical now? But I signed that book because it looks at the debate in the 1950s over violence versus nonviolence, this idea that black people should be able to defend themselves 
um, uh, uh, from people who are trying to violate them. And it also connects to what's going on right now because there's this big debate in America over now over who does the Second Amendment apply to? And I think we can have a good debate about that uh, in a couple of weeks when we read that book, particularly in light of current events. And the last book deals with one of my favorite books. It talks about the revolt of the black athlete, uh, the black power movement for black athletes, uh, uh, collegiate um, uh, student athletes, and also professional athletes were undergoing this period of racial awareness. And what, as we've seen over the last four years with Colin Ka Kaepernick's stance, even up to now with student athletes protesting and demanding more from their institutions, I think it'll show in many ways just how history sort of uh, repeats itself. But I think those books will be fun for you to read. Uh, and I think and I think you will enjoy them. Hopefully you'll be able to soak up uh, some of the knowledge. All right, let's get to it. Why is black history controversial? Even the, the, the teaching of black history in itself is controversial. Every February during Black History Month, I get invited to a number of high schools. And inevitably, I am always asked before I go, well, Dr. Moore, what are you gonna talk about? Uh, the principal is kind of worried. Uh, the superintendent doesn't know if it's a good idea. And so just a thought provoking question for you, all, I want you to think about why is black history controversial? It shouldn't be controversial. It is a part of the fabric of, of American history, but in so many places it's controversial. In the 1960s, when black students were demanding black studies courses at major universities, there were three critiques. The first critique was, was well, we, we can't offer a course like that because black people haven't made any meaningful contributions to US society. That was the first critique. Uh, the second critique was that, well, although you all may have made a meaningful contribution to society, we feel as if teaching a course like this will stir up racial tensions. How can a group of people talking about their history stir up racial tensions, all right? And number three, the third issue was, well, we can't find anybody qualified to teach it. And I start off all my classes with this because Black studies and African-American history as a discipline is very controversial. The state of Texas, for the first time in its history, adopted African-American studies as an elective in high schools less than a year ago. Now, that's 20, 2019, 2020, but in Cleveland, Ohio, where I'm from, Cleveland, Detroit, Chicago, New York, Philadelphia, Los Angeles, we've been teaching black history in the high schools since the late 60s, early 70s. So even in some parts of the South, the teaching of black history is very, very, uh, controversial. All right, so here we go. So here's our first question. I think Helen is going to put it in, in, in a poll for you. What came first, slavery or racism? What came first, slavery or racism? It's a question that probably had, there is no definitive answer for. I can argue both sides. But it's just a, a, a debate historians have been having for, for decades about which came first. And I'll say this, one argument says, well, slavery came first. They enslaved African people. And then to justify their enslavement of them, they had to develop a racial narrative around it. So that argument suggests that slavery came first. And in order to justify the treatment of enslaved Africans in the Americas, you have to come up with the race, racial narrative or racist fiction in many ways to justify the treatment of, of people. The other argument on the flip side says that racism came first. And some people will argue that the entire idea of enslaving Africans has to come from a racist point of view, all right? So you can argue in many uh, both ways. It'll be interesting to see what, what, what the poll answer suggests we'll and we'll get to that in a minute. So, Dr. Moore, the uh, Dr. Moore, the uh, the yeah. the answer is uh, so far eighty to twenty, eighty percent racism, twenty percent slavery. Awesome. Okay. Oh, I love this technology. I, lo I love I love the the instant feedback. All right. So 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 let let me elaborate a little further. So I'm gonna give you the six reasons why Africans were enslaved, and then I'm gonna see if that may change how you would answer the question. And, and, and I do this in every lecture I give, we, we need to just talk at a base level why Africans were enslaved. Number one, and this is in no particular order, these are just six reasons. Number one, 
For the European mindset, there was seemingly an endless supply of labor in Africa. And yes, it is true, a system of domestic inservitude existed in West Africa. All right, so that's number one. There was seemingly an endless supply of labor. Number two, Africans were immune to many of the diseases in the North American colonies. Virginia, South Carolina, North Carolina, Georgia, all right? Many white indigenous servants and white colonists, remember, died out, all right? Number three, they were not Christian, all right? So they had a spiritual reason for enslaving them. They said that this would get them on the path in many ways uh, to, to, uh, to Christianity, that they would get saved. And so slavery was not a bad thing for them. It was actually a good thing for them because it was taking them from heathen in many ways to child of God. Number four, they were skilled in agriculture, skilled in agriculture. And again, I am not a slavery expert and you can look all this up. There are tons of books on this stuff, but specific ethnic groups from certain parts of West Africa were skilled in certain things. I ask my students all the time, do you really think somebody from England went to South Carolina and knew how to set up a rice plantation? Or somebody from Wales went to Louisiana along the Mississippi River and knew how to set up a sugar plantation. So understand, they are skilled in agriculture, but they are also skilled in what we would call the skilled trades. If you ever go to New Orleans and you walk through the French Quarter, I've been told and some researchers have said that a lot of the architecture of the French Quarter was designed by folks from Senegal. And there was a direct connection between Senegal and Louisiana. There's a plantation house called Lower Plantation about an hour from New Orleans, all right? It's a Creole plantation they talk about. And the person who gives the tour guide says about that back in 2001, 2002, a young man pulled up in a cab. He was about six, five. He was from Senegal. And he looked at the house and he said, my uncle lives in a house just like that back at home. And so even now making these connections in terms of architecture. So again, Africans were, were skilled in architecture, but also in the so-called skilled trades. Uh, number five, they were not familiar with the geography. When they attempted to enslave Native Americans, Native Americans could run away more familiar with the geography. Enslaved Africans weren't familiar with the geography. And number six, the last reason, the color of their skin. They could not run away without being easily identified. If you know anything about white indentured servitude in the US, they tried to uh, put poor whites to work, but when they brought them from England, they, they would run away and they would not be easily identifiable. So again, this is just a survey of six of the reasons why Africans were uh, enslaved. We'll take a couple questions now, uh, Helen, if we got any. Yes. Um, so in, so Joanna Drake asks, in the NYT 1619 article, President Lincoln said that he wasn't for slavery, but that he also wasn't for black equality. Do you think this sentiment is still held by white and non-black Americans today? Ooh, that's a deep question. Can we, Joanna, can we, can we deal with that? Um, let, let me come back to that at the end of the lecture. Let me come back to that. Okay. All right. Cause that is, uh, yeah, that question could take us off, could take us, could take us off in a whole nother direction. All right. And then, um, what about the fact that slavery has existed since biblical times? Absolutely. There, there is no doubt about that. Uh, I think the distinction is what we are calling here is a chattel, Slavery. Yes, slavery did exist. Uh, prisons of war, things of that nature, more of a domestic form of uh, slavery. But typically the slavery you see here in the former North American colonies, uh, people have argued has been arguably the most brutal, the most brutal uh, on the face of the earth, just in terms of uh, the damage done to people, the damage done to the continent of Africa. And as we'll talk about in a minute, you know, we'll make this connection between you know, the enslavement of Africans in the U.S. and the Industrial Revolution, you know, and I, I can argue and historians argue that without slavery in the U.S., the United States does not become this economic engine, that the, the basis of American wealth came from these large cotton plantations in the deep, deep South, as we'll see uh, in a minute. All right, let's move on. Next question. So poll question, does the Constitution make mention of slavery or race? This is a poll question. Does the Constitution make any mention of slavery or race? Does the Constitution make any mention of slavery or race? The 
document that we hold so precious, all right? You know, uh, the Constitution make mention of slavery or race, all right? Helen, you got any results yet? Um, it's wavering back and forth, but it's 50, about over 50% on slavery and 58% and on race, although okay. slavery is going up a little bit, but you know, it's, it's pretty close. All right, so here we go. So the Constitution, there are three mentions of slavery in the Constitution, all right? The first is going to be Article 1, Section 2, all right? We know how they set up um, the Senate, right? The U.S. Senate even now Two senators from each state go in the Senate. And now the House of Representatives, right, is based upon population. But when they were getting the country together, there was this big debate over how enslaved Africans would be counted for representation purposes. White Southerners include saying, no, these are people. Although we own them, these are people. So these, so these, so, so the people we are holding in bondage, they should count toward our population numbers. White Northerners said, no, you don't treat them like people. They have no rights like a person, so you can't count them at all. So the compromise they came up with was that for representation purposes, black people, enslaved folks would count for three fifths of a person. So when you hear black people talking about three fifths and you know, I'm only, you only consider me three fifths of a person, they didn't make it up. They are going back to the constitution where it said for representation purposes, enslaved Africans will count for three fifths of a person. Now, here's what I wonder. Why three fifths? Why not five sevenths, right? Why not two thirds? You know, but they came up with three fifths of a person. The second place you see slavery in the constitution deals with the fugitive slave law, article four, section three. And they put in the constitution that if an enslaved African leaves a slave state and goes to a free state, although that person is now in a free state, they are still in many ways enslaved. So it gave the owner the power to go to a free state and bring that African back down to the South. So that's number two. The third piece, and this is interesting, Article 1, Section 9, it deals with the closing of the Atlantic slave trade or the closing of the importation of Africans to what is now, uh, or to what was then uh, United States of America, English North America. So they didn't say that from here on, um, uh, you cannot import any Africans. What they said was in 1808, in 1808, you will no longer be able to bring in Africans from, uh, from any other parts of the world. So, so here's the question, the constitution, several iterations, 1780s, 1790s. So what do you think happened between 1793 when this thing, was, when this portion of the constitution was ratified in 1808? If you are a slave trader and you know that by 1808, this is gonna be cut off or it will be illegal, what do you think happened between 1793 and 1808? Exactly. They wanted to bring in as many Africans as they could from the continent, all right? Because they knew that once 1808 came, it would be illegal. So the constitution does mention slavery in three places. So Ibram Kendi's book, Stamp from the Beginning, talks about how even at the beginning of this country's founding, all right, at the beginning, the only group singled out for, dis for disparate treatment would be African-Americans, all right? His book is called Stamp from the Beginning, and he talks about that constitution piece a little bit. All right, now, many of you know that slavery largely will begin uh, in, in, in the upper South, Virginia, North Carolina, South Carolina, Maryland. If you know anything about South Carolina, you know that at one point, South Carolina, South Carolina was majority black. You had majority enslaved Africans in South Carolina than free white people, all right? However, with the invention of King Cotton, the whole institution of slavery in many ways with the invention of, of, of King Cotton, the Louisiana Purchase, the whole institution of slavery will shift in many ways from the upper South to the deep South. To grow cotton, you need about 180 days of good weather. And so when they saw how much money could be made with cotton, plantation owners 
would try to relocate their enslaved Africans from Virginia to Texas, Louisiana, Mississippi, Alabama, uh, parts of Florida, Arkansas, places of that nature, because that is where the money was. Now, what we call this movement in Africans is the, is the domestic slave trade, the trading of African people within the United States, the trading of African people within the United States. Uh, if you go watch Solomon Northup's 12 Years a Slave, that movie, they have some good scenes in there about um, the domestic slave trade and the slave auction block and things of that nature. Dinah Berry, who I just mentioned, just wrote a phenomenal book about uh, the domestic slave trade and slave prices and the value of people and things of that nature. So her work can definitely give you a lot more insight into this idea of slave trading within the United States. Now, without cotton, y'all gotta get this, without cotton, there is no industrial revolution. I learned all about Eli Whitney in elementary school. Nobody ever made the connection between an enslaved African picking cotton in Mississippi, that cotton going to New England or Boston to a textile mill, and then those goods being shipped to Europe. Nobody ever made the connection for me. But understand, cotton was America's greatest asset. Its greatest asset between 1810 and 1860. Cotton is what will make the United States an economic giant. But we are never taught to make those Connections. And some people say that Eli Whitney really invented the cotton gin, or was it an enslaved African out there? Uh, in, the, the enslaved African invented the cotton gin. Now, when we talk about the domestic slave trade, I'm going to give you some ballpark figures. And, and that, one historian has said that the domestic slave trade involved over 1 million trade transactions. That doesn't mean 1 million people have been sold, it means that. There were 1 million transactions, meaning people could have been sold multiple times. Historians also say that 50% of all the sales, check this out now, 50% of every sale involved the destruction of a nuclear family. Family being broken up, destruction of a nuclear family. 33% of all sales involved, here we go now, the destruction of a first marriage. Of a, so, the sales are going to disrupt the nuclear family and also separate husbands and wives, all right? But understand, this trade jumps off because of the demand for cotton, and they want to relocate the Africans from Virginia, North Carolina, Maryland area to the deep south. So when you hear Black people talking about, quote, we built this country, they are not making stuff up. We understand the connection between capitalism and slavery. And if you know what, you've ever been in New Orleans or Mobile, Alabama, or Charleston, South Carolina, those are three of the largest slave trading sites in the country, and I believe also Natchez, Mississippi. New Orleans, Mobile, Natchez, Charleston. I may be missing a couple, but the original, one of the original slave trading sites in America was on Wall Street, and that was in the 16 to 1700s. What is Wall Street today? was in many ways a slave trading center involving the sale of Africans within uh, the United States, all right? Any questions about the domestic slave trade before we, before we keep it moving? Okay. Um, Dr. Moore, yep. you had talked about the three-fifths, and so is the electoral college tied to this idea of the three-fifths of a person? I don't, I don't well, I don't know, I guess if you're looking at it, well, I'm not sure when the electoral college was started, and, and you know, I've been a professor 23 years. I think I'm pretty smart. I think I can figure stuff out. I still don't understand the electoral college. You know, I don't understand the electors. I still don't understand it. But, you know, I mean, I think this foundational piece of this three-fifths of a person, I think in many ways, uh, that was a signal for a long time of how African-Americans would be treated in, in the United States of America. Uh, Dr. Moore, how do you... Uh... How do you resolve the argument that slaves are not humans with the reason that slavery can bring enslaved people to Christianity? Right. Well, I mean, there are so many, so many contradictions there, right? Right. So many contradictions there. And so you see, they have to come up with the racial with, 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 with the racial narrative to justify actions. But it is very, very hip hypocritical. And if you read a lot of literature uh, during the antebellum period, that was justifying slavery, they have biblical justification for slavery, you will find that they are 
they, they are ripe with hypocrisies. Also, if you go back to the revolutionary period, um, uh, the revolutionary period, 1700s, when uh, the US, when we were trying to get um, independence from Britain, the colonists were arguing that Britain was in quote, enslaving them, that they were being treated like slaves. And people would say, well, hold on a minute, how can you say Britain is treating you like slaves when you were actually enslaving other people there in you know, the British colony of North America? So uh, the answer to that question, it was rife with uh, hypocrisy and contradictions. And um, two questions, why enslave Africans and not another race? I think you alluded to that a little bit. And is it true that black people were enslaved in the US until recently as 1980s? I don't know, I don't know what, I'll limit that if I don't know what, I don't know what definition you're using uh, enslaved. I'll tell you this, in um, 2000, I was hired by the US Army Corps of Engineers to go to the Mississippi Delta. Uh, they had found a, a, a old cemetery of enslaved Africans in Mississippi uh, and the Army Corps of Engineers, they were going to build, they were going to build a bridge or dam there, but they had to send somebody out to look at the historical nature of the cemetery. They, they ended up not building the bridge through the cemetery. They preserved it. But I flew into Jackson, Mississippi, got a rental car, drove to Greenwood, Mississippi, and then I had to drive about like 15 miles out in, out in the country area. Uh, and when I pulled up, there was a sign that said, so-and-so plantation. And as I'm driving on this large piece of property, I saw about six or seven uh, black men on a truck, you know, with the plantation name on the side of the truck. And I'm under the perception that they were living on the plantation. And I don't know what the arrangement was, but the arrangement was very bizarre to me. And so I, so when people talk about slavery until 1980, uh, I don't know about that because I don't know what, what your definition is. Do I believe that there are some people in, in rural areas who were, who, who were still tied to the land and working there in exchange to live there for free? Absolutely. I believe that. I believe that that has gone on for some time. All right. We got one more, Helen, before we move on. Sure. Um, there's a couple of questions uh, regarding indigenous, let's see. Um, so I'd love to, so first of all, can you better define what is meant by Chateau? Correct me if I'm wrong. How I pronounce that? Chattel slavery. I'd Chattel love to slavery. Okay. chattel okay. slavery. I'd love to hear a bit of, of commentary about Native American participation in chattel slavery. Now, the Native American piece, you had a lot of cultural interaction going on at the time. I think in some places, Native Americans assisted enslaved Africans with running away and getting their freedom, and I think in other places, I think Native Americans assisted uh, uh, slave owners and slave own slaveholders and slave owners. Uh, with recapturing African American. The one thing about American history, it is not all cut and dry. You know what I mean? It is not all cut and dry. And the more and more I read about Black history, and I, I hear all the, you know, it, 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 it's not all cut and dry. One example, my mom grew up in a, a segregated school in Franklinton, Louisiana, where Jerome Wilson went and where he was lynched. And reading some of those uh, from the time period, uh, there was a black high school in town, and of course there was a white high school in town. The black high school went up to like ninth grade, the white high school to 12th grade. And although the town was rigidly segregated, I'm reading that the, the white marching band would come play at the black football games like every other week. And so when you hear this stuff, you know, it doesn't fit our nice, nice, our nice neat narrative, right, of American, uh, of American racial history. So the more you read, the more you'll discover you know, these outlying things and things that will just completely kind of shock you uh, and surprise you, all right? All right, let's talk about the pain of slavery for a little bit. <clears throat> I mentioned earlier that, you know, my kids, sometimes they don't want to watch slavery movies because they say that is kind of depressing, all right? I, for one, believe that we don't talk about the pain of slavery enough, all right? I think we talk about how we were resilient how we built great communities and how, how we survived it, and that is true. But I don't think we talk about the pain of slavery enough, the punishments, uh, the murders, uh, the sexual assaults, uh, the idea that you, know, you didn't have control over yourself or anybody else, you couldn't protect in many ways uh, your family. So I don't think we talk about that enough. And so I've been advocating in many ways, a return to in many ways, uh, the horror of enslavement, the horror of enslavement to talk about just how brutal of an institution it is. Um, me and my wife live in Round Rock and we were looking for houses 
Uh, we went past a neighborhood, well, a street. Um, I think it's called Plantation Trace or something like that. And we just look at each other because all throughout the South, sometimes we have housing subdivisions name with the, with the word plantation on it. We may have restaurants with the term plantation on it. When I got to LSU in 1998, um, uh, the big restaurant where a lot of faculty staff would eat was called the Plantation Room. And nobody had a problem with that. And what they said, well, Dr. Moore, plantations just means, you know, a big plot of land. I'm like, yeah, but not really. The first time you see plantation mentioned is in connection with racial slavery. And, that, you know, that is the connotation. So even now we are reminded just of how, in many ways, uh, how slavery is always before us. But, but I want us to bring the horror back into slavery. We would see things like, you know, plantation, uh, plantation trace and plantation homes. And, you know, I'm saying that I got some plantation shutters in my house. So I'm even caught up in it. All right, let's move on. So the Civil War, 1860, you got about 4.4 million Black folk living in the U.S. Four million are enslaved in the South. 400,000 are free in the North. Here's the question. When we talk about white Southern culture in the antebellum period or before the Civil War, why do you think there was class harmony? You had the large slave owners who were at the top. You had the yeoman farmer who was in the middle. The yeoman farmer may own one or two Africans. And then you had a large group of people at the bottom called poor whites. If you were a poor white person, why would you go fight for the Confederacy? Because understand, as long as you are in the presence of, of, or, or as long as you are living in a slave society or you are in the presence of enslaved Africans, you will never be able to earn a fair wage. You can't compete against free labor. So what, what was in it for poor whites? Why did poor whites go fight to preserve a system that enslaved them? that kept them from growing. You gotta understand, on, in, in the South prior to the Civil War, there are no public schools. Not only do uh, the, 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 the wealthy people not want enslaved Africans to learn how to read, they don't want poor whites to know how to read. They wanna keep poor whites ignorant. Poor whites are homeless. They are eking out an existence. So why do poor whites go fight in the Confederacy to preserve something that actually hurts them, all right? It hurts them. They couldn't compete economically, but why do they run out in large numbers to put on these uniforms to preserve a system of slavery, you know, really fighting for the Confederacy? That's something to think about. So here's what we say. Poor whites in the white South got a, what we call a psychological wage from being white. David Rodiger has an amazing book called The Wages of Whiteness. And he talks about how wealthy white people in the South convinced the yeoman farmer and convinced the poor whites that they were all on the same team, that we are all one. And he talks about how even some of that carried it well into the 20th century, you know, this idea that white Southerners don't talk, about, there, there are no class interests here. We are all white and we are all one. So the reason they go fight is it gives them a psychological wage. The yeoman farmer believes in the system because they believe if they work hard enough, they can get a large plantation and own 30, 40, 50 Africans. The poor white person's benefit is that they have somebody to look down upon. And that is what David Rodiger talks about, sort of the wages of whiteness or the psychological wage they get in many ways for being white, all right? The Civil War, 1861, 1865, and I always get this question from kids. Uh, well, Dr. Moore, who freed the slaves? I said, well, they freed themselves, all right? Does Lincoln give an Emancipation Proclamation? Absolutely, but typically they freed themselves, meaning that they often got up and just left the plantation, and oftentimes they went and found refuge in the Union Army. Now, here's how Juneteenth connects with that. You know, Texas is a long way from Mississippi, Alabama, parts of Louisiana. You typically didn't get your freedom until the Union Army got there and kind of enforced it, right? And so you had enslaved Africans in parts of Central Texas and West Texas, right, 
who didn't, who didn't, who the, 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 the Emancipation Proclamation was not enforced until the Union Army got there. And that's why in parts of Texas, June 19th, 1865 is seen as the day uh, of emancipation, all right? Any questions at all about this whole idea of white Southerners and this idea that all white people in the South where were all their interests were aligned and why would poor white Southerners go fight for something that actually hurt them? We'll take a couple of questions before we move on. <clears throat> Dr. Moore, I, uh, there are so many questions. I, okay. I we have, yeah. So um, I'm I'm still going through all of them, but um, so some of the questions are: um, What do you think was the percentage of people made up of enslaved people and percentage of poor whites? Estimates, obviously. Mm -hmm. Okay. Okay. Mm -hmm. Don't know the answer to that, but go ahead. <laughs> okay. Um, let's see. Uh, um, as a, so the pain of slavery as a historian and a parent what do you think is more impactful for raising awareness reading fictions like Toni Morrison's Beloved or non-fictions like the slave narratives of Harriet Jacobs or Frederick Douglass or watching films I think all of the above <clears throat> I don't think it's either or you know what I mean I think it's all of the above and I think that's one of the great things about the black experience films, interviews, documentaries, uh, fictional books, uh, you know, nonfiction, you know, I just try to soak it all up. But, you know, but I understand my kids sometimes, um, but but I have to fight through that. I'm like, no, we're going to watch this film. You need to understand it. They say, daddy, I know it, all right? But my fear is that if the pain of it uh, keeps them away, you know, what will happen when they have children? So, so part, you know, I'm processing that as a parent. Um, because I, I just believe, you know, we, we, we need to expose it all, right? So we can really um, deal with the true essence uh, of, of American history. You got one more, Helen? <clears throat> yes. Um, the, the white Southerners thing part of Nixon's Southern strategy, is that what you're referring to? Yeah, they're they up in 1968, but go ahead. <laughs> okay. Um, do you, Dr. Moore, do you see these class dynamics as continuing today? Yes, I do. I mean, if you think about it, the United States is one of the only major industrial countries who hasn't had a working class revolution, all right? And I'm a big sports fan. And if you ever follow a debate between a professional athlete trying to get paid um, and an owner or management trying not to pay the athlete, Many rank and file people will side with the owner, all right? And, and I always use this example, you know, even talking about, you know, working class politics in Cleveland, how, you know, 30s, 40s, 50s, you have a white person and a black person working at the steel mill. They work together, their lives are very similar, but some kind of way, the, 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 the white employee oftentimes would identify with management and not with, you know, their black brothers and sisters who, who they're working on the assembly line with. You know, and, and, and luckily there's been a lot of um, books recently presented on, um, you know, poor whites and working class white people and their political fault. And I think some historians argue that wealthy whites in many ways have manipulated uh, lower class white people, um, getting them to think race first as opposed to about their economic, about their economic interests. Right? There's a good book you may want to check out and it's called Dying of Whiteness. Dying of whiteness, and it looks at uh, some working class white communities across the U.S. Um, in many ways, how they're against the Affordable Care Act, how they don't want any kind of um, uh, environmental protection. They live near chemical plants and things of that nature. And the author says that uh, they have such a disdain for government that although the Affordable Care Act would help them, and although uh, EPA protection would help them live healthier lives that they have such a disdain for government that they are willing to die in many ways for their, for their political for their political beliefs, all right? We'll take one more, Helen. Do you have any thoughts on parallels between the psychological wage concept explaining why poor whites fought for the Confederacy and the current socioeconomic class divides today? This concept seems similar to rural Americans supporting conservative politics, despite these political leanings actually not really benefiting them. 
let me say this, and, and I know we're going to talk about Trump a little later. Um, my analysis of the 2016 election was that Trump, uh, and whatever you think of him, I, I don't want to get into that debate right now, was that for whatever reason, he became sort of a voice for uh, 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 rural white America um, and things of that nature. And so we can say what we want, but you know, I think he, he, he filled a void there. You know, he feels in many, they feel in many ways as if he is representing, um, you know, their thoughts and their ideas. Um, the one thing I realized, you know, um, you know, we can't think for other people. And I had to stop doing that, like trying to figure out why, you know, and if they say, well, Dr. Moore, I think he represents, you know, my political beliefs, uh, then I believe them. You know, it's easy for us to say, well, what has he done for you? But we all know that politics in many ways is largely symbolic in certain, in certain instances. So that's what I think um, uh, leads many rural whites to, and working class whites to vote for Trump. Um, he is expressing in many ways the things that they want to say. I think they felt that they've been left behind by both by both parties in many ways, the Republican Party uh, and the Democratic Party, all right? All right, let's talk about making freedom a bit. And this is important. And, and, and uh, I want to talk about the seven things um, uh, black people did after slavery. And I think these things are critical. And these things happened about a, a span of a year or two and I want us to get this because I think this will say a lot, not only about the institution of slavery, but also about the lives that black people are envisioning for themselves uh, now that uh, slavery uh, is over. The first thing they did, step one, they left the plantation. They left the plantation. They wanted to get as far away from that traumatic, from that tra traumatic uh, geographical space as possible. Now understand, some of them may have spent their lives on a plantation. Some of their relatives may have been buried there. But they also understand that that was a place of horror and it was traumatizing. So the first thing they did, they left the plantation. And the reason this was revolutionary is because white Southerners had convinced themselves that enslaved Africans really enjoyed their condition, that they really enjoyed it. They wouldn't go anywhere even after emancipation, that they would stay there and still work on the plantation and in many ways still serve their former owner. So that's number one, they left the plantation just moving, going somewhere else. Number two, they reunited their families. Now, we talked about the domestic slave trade and how it, it separated families. So just imagine Leonard Moore is in Washington Parish. I'm, I'm, I'm enslaved in Washington Parish, Louisiana. My wife, Thais, was sold away from here 10 years ago and the only thing I know is that she was sold to Jackson. So you would have stories of people after the Civil War, literally walking, uh, getting on a horse, going all throughout the South trying to find a spouse. So just use this example. So I, if I learned my wife was sold to Jackson, that's all I know. I may leave Washington Parish and I may go to Jackson, Louisiana, two hours away. She's not there. Hmm. I may walk to Jackson, Mississippi. Hmm. She's not there. Wow. Let me go to Jackson, Tennessee. Maybe she's in Jackson, Tennessee. She's not there. Maybe go, let me go to Jackson, Arkansas. So they were spending time reuniting their families because the family piece meant so much to them. All right. So they want to reunite their family. That's number two. Number three, they changed their names. They changed their names. One of my favorite uh, Malcolm X um, interviews is when somebody asks him what his last name is and he says, I don't know his last name. And the reporter says, well, isn't your last name Little? He said, no, Little is the name the slave master uh, gave my grandfather, all right? So the changing of the name was very, very important. They wanted to have their own names. They wanted to have their own names. Now check this out, and I, and I mention this every semester. If you look at the names of the first five or six presidents, Washington, Adams, Jefferson, Monroe, Jackson. Nowadays, those are considered black last names, all right? Nowadays, those are considered black last names. So I think when they were changing their names, they went with something kind of familiar, all right? And, you know, and, 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 I, and I tell people all the time, you know, let me know how many white people you can find with the last name Washington, with the last name Adams, with the last name Jefferson, and with the last name Jackson. You may not find too many. So they changed their names because that was very, very important. Let me put a pause there and let me say this. When I do diversity training, 
One of the things I tell a lot of staff people, I tell faculty, staff, whoever, uh, don't shorten somebody's name because it's convenient for you. And I think we as Americans, we disrespect, particularly international people all the time, if they come with a name with four or five or six syllables, we'll joke about it. They'll be like, well, can I call you this? And so I to ask, to call people by their real name. And if they give you permission to shorten it or use a nickname, then do that. But we have to begin to respect people's names uh, in America. All right, let's move back on. All right, number four. The fourth thing they did, they acquired land. General Sherman, and I love how UT history connects with all of this. General Sherman, Union General, he conquered the South, Georgia, South Carolina, North Carolina. He has a meeting with formerly enslaved people in South Carolina. And he says, what can we do for you? A delegation of black men and women go see General Sherman and they say, we want to be left alone. Give us some land. We don't want to be around anybody else. We will take care of ourselves. We don't need any government support. And General Sherman issues field order number 15, what we know as 40 acres and a mule. He promises them that they will get up to a 40 acre tract of land. A month later, he throws in a mule and they would get land, Georgia, North Carolina, South Carolina, along the coastal areas of the upper south, all right? They wanted to do for themselves. Give us a piece of property. Understand, they are skilled in agriculture. They know how to lay out a farm. So they're thinking, you give me those 40 acres, I don't need any help. Get out of my way. I'm going to build my family. We're going to build institutions, and we're going to thrive as a community. That lasted for about four months. Four months. The 40 acres in a mule deal lasted four months. When Abraham Lincoln gets assassinated, President Andrew Johnson takes over, and he rescinds that order, giving that land back to uh, its former white owner. So understand the 40 acres in a mule piece is very, very important because that was a desire that free people wanted. Give us a piece of land and get out of our way. All right, number five. They built homes. They built homes, number five. Number six, they started schools. Now, this is why this is important. And I remind people that in the South, there were no public schools in the South prior to the Civil War because rich people want to keep, they want to keep everybody ignorant. They want to keep everybody in some kind of uh, bondage. Don't want them to know anything. Don't want them to be able to read. And understand also in the South, it was a capital offense in some places for a white person to teach an enslaved African how to read. And on the plantation, those enslaved Africans who knew how to read and write, they often kept it quiet because that was seen as a threat to the power structure, all right? So they started schools. That was one of the first thing they did. And when we talk about the reconstruction period next week, you'll learn that when black people were serving in public office, after the Civil War for a period of four or five years, they set up public schools for everybody in the state. All right, so they established schools right after the Civil War. And number seven, they started churches. They wanted to have their own religious experience. Now, this is important because on the plantation, they were often subject to a steady diet of sermons dealing with slaves obey your masters, all right? They had a different interpretation of scripture they didn't read the Bible from the viewpoint of the oppressor. They read the Bible from the viewpoint of the oppressed, all right? So they had a totally different interpretation of what the scriptures meant to them. They looked at the Bible as a liberating document, whereas the slave owner looked at it as a document to keep them in many ways, not only in physical bondage, but also in spiritual bondage as well. All right, any questions at all about this idea of making freedom, the, the things they did like right after they uh, got free. Um, Dr. Ward, so part of the um, a previous, and it goes to what you're alluding to, is you mentioned that poor whites were persuaded to fight with the Confederates by convincing them that they too would be, uh, could one day be successful. Mm -hmm. Was this the beginning of the American dream as we know it today, as in the belief that success in the US, U.S. is dependent on merit more than other in other Western countries? The American dream, no, it's not. The American dream 
is not possible without government intervention. We'll talk about in a few weeks how in many ways the government created the white middle class in the 1940s and even before that how westward expansion, how you know when people were settling the west, how the government just gave people land. So the American dream has is, is you know it's a little different. You know people think it's just about hard work. No, but when we talk about the 1930s and 40s and how the, 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 the government basically gave, gave giving people houses for free and things of that nature, we'll see that the American dream is a little bit more, more complicated than this idea of somebody just, uh, just working hard. And uh, this is one about UT. Is there a connection between the 40 acres Black people were asking for and the 40 acres of UT? I have no idea. Um, I don't know. I mean, that's the first thing I thought about, right? You know, even when I got here, 40 acres. Um, I don't know. I think 40 acre tracts of land were kind of standard in the South. I know the, the property my mom was born on, uh, her parents had 80 acres. And so I, I, part of me believes that those are just large tracts of land that they gave out at the time. All right. Um, let's see. Was 40 acres and a mule viewed, viewed as a tool of northern carpet baggers to gain support? Uh, I mean, I think of two things. Number one, it was to help out, you know, these, these former enslaved people. And also, number two, it was used to, you know, to punish the Confederates, you know, take their land from them, you know, uh, take, not only take their land from them, but, but give the land to people that used to work the land. All right. So I think it had, you know, I think it served, uh, you know, two main two main purposes. A uh, couple of questions regarding Christianity. Why did slaves adapt uh, Christianity, adopt Christianity after it was used to oppress them, and why continue to work and uh, worship in a religion that was pushed upon them by oppressors instead of rejecting that religion? Wow. Here we go. All right. So, I think you can make an argument. Um, all three of the major Western religions, Judaism, Islam, uh, Christianity, <clears throat> have issues, all right? I can't, I can't speak for them. You know, that, that question comes up a lot. And, and me, you know, I'm a, I identify as a Christian. I, I, I passed it for seven years. And I get that question, but Dr. Moore, you seem to be so woke. You know, how could you, you know, uh, worship the white man's religion and things of that nature? Um, I really believe that the Bible is a liberating document. Um, uh, I believe that in America, we read it the wrong way. Um, you know, we read it from the viewpoint uh, of the oppressor as opposed to the way it was written. It was written from the viewpoint of the oppressed. And I'll give you an example. If you think about the story of uh, uh, Genesis Exodus, that story, you know, uh, uh, that's the story of basically Egyptian oppression uh, then you move into uh, Assyrian oppression, uh, Babylonian oppression. Then in the New Testament, you do with, you know, Greco-Roman oppression. So that is the way I think many, some people looked at it, all right? You no, know, they were just reading the Bible the wrong way. And although they twisted the teachings uh, of the Bible and Jesus, we, we really understand the true teachings. Mm -hmm. But that's a, that's a phenomenal question that I even get a lot um, in my, just in my day-to-day -day walk. One more, Dr. Moore? Yeah, one more. Okay. Um, not sure if you have this answer, but is there a general idea as to how many freed slaves were able to reunite with their families? What impact do you believe it has had on the Black family thereafter? Um, not sure. Don't, don't have the data. Um, but, but one of the tragic things about that, you would hear stories of people, you know, looking for their families, looking for former spouses, and you find them and they've been remarried, you know what I mean? And so, but, but you hear about a lot of these, a lot of these, a lot of stories like that. That's what made it, you know, even more tragic, you know, traveling long distances to find a former spouse, a spouse, and then understand that they have gotten remarried and established a new family. <clears throat> but um, I mean, the, the, the black family, I would argue, um, has always been to some degree uh, under attack to some degree, particularly in this period and well into the 20th century. Got one more, Helen, real quick before we finish up? Sure. Um, let's see, specifically to what you're referring to. Um, let's see. It makes me wonder how someone, especially such a massive population, white people, elite, and poor, holds such hatred and such greed to keep 
try to keep themselves ahead. I know the US and Western cultures have very individualistic social structures. Given the series of movements we have seen over the past several decades, you think that the US is more moving towards a collectivistic society. Wow, collectivistic society. Uh, the, the U.S. has its issues, and I don't, I'm not going to be an apologist. The U.S. has its issues, um, but I, you know, I really think the U.S. has made a lot of progress over the last four or five decades. I, I don't, I don't want to deny that. Um, you know, I've been to six continents. I got one continent to go. That's Antarctica. All right, and uh, you know, if you go to a lot of other places, you know, you, 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 um, you, you really. Uh, how do I say this? Uh, when you go a lot of other places, I, I think it is harder for some ethnic groups to move ahead than others, all right? Uh, so despite the problems in the U.S., despite its issues, uh, you know, we got to remember, the U.S. is still a relatively young country, you know what I mean? Maybe roughly, what, 300 years, something like that? A relatively young country. Uh, but I'm optimistic that things will continue to get better, you know, and you know, I'm optimistic that we have, you know, people fighting, you know, young people on the front line saying they want things to change. So I just try to be, you know, an eternally optimistic, uh, optimistic person while recognizing the issues, but also, uh, you know, owning that, you know, the U.S. has done some stuff good in terms of race relations. All right. All right, let's finish up. Let's talk about uh, this criminal criminalization piece. And what you see here, and you watch some of the videos, I hope, is a pattern. 13th, 14th, 15th Amendment gets passed. 13th Amendment abolishes slavery. 14th Amendment grants uh, citizenship to anybody born here. And 15th Amendment gives, uh, you know, all males, black males, uh, the right to vote, all right? But what you start to see here in this period is whenever black folks get legislative victories, all right, uh, the enemies of black progress find a way despite those legislative victories, right, to keep them in a position of, 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 uh, of servitude. And what you saw in those videos is these things called the Black Codes that developed after slavery was over, 1865, 1866, all right? Professor Muhammad has one of the great three-minute clips on there. He says white Southerners were ter completely terrified that their entire way of life had shifted. Now we have four billion people um, and the fear was if black folk were free, the fear was that in many ways they would try to dominate them. So you have these laws and these codes that pop up as a way of doing two things. Number one, to restrict their movement, to keep them from exercising their freedom. And number two, to get them back on the plantation. Number two is critical because the entire economy was built on agriculture. And if these people are not working in the fields, they're not picking that cotton, they're not harvesting that sugar cane, then in many ways, not only does the regional economy dry up, but it affects the national economy as well. So they come up with all these crazy laws designed to instill fear, to get them back on the plantation, and to restrict movement. Now, the biggest thing is this idea of these vagrancy laws. I don't know, if can anybody define what a vagrant is? Vagrant is one of those words like uh, loitering. You know, I mean, I, you know, I tell people loitering is a is a crime against you know doing nothing. All right, vagrancy. So they had these vagrancy laws that you you watched the video, you heard about them, where basically if you couldn't show proof of employment by like the first of the year, you were convicted of a crime and sent to work somewhere. All right, these vagrancy laws. So if you are a formerly enslaved African in Meridian, Mississippi in 1866, where do you want to apply for a job at? The, your only options are to be back in the field working. And so that's why these black codes were so restrictive. And you know, Professor Muhammad talks about these pig laws, right? Laws against, you know, stealing chickens and stealing pigs and these larceny laws about how, how these, these stiff punishments came into place because they needed them back on the plantation to work. And so this is what we talk about when we talk about criminalization. And later on, you all will hopefully watch that, uh, the 13th documentary, even now how the criminal justice system seems to criminalize 
uh, poor black and brown, poor black and brown people. So understand the pattern throughout black history, legislative victories are won. The opponents of black progress find a way, loopholes, whatever, to manipulate that to keep black folks in a position of service. Let me give you an example. Here's what I ask all my students. If black men got the right to vote with the 15th Amendment, women get the right to vote, 19, 19, 19, 1920, all right? What was the civil rights movement for? Why are we marching for voting rights if, the, if we have constitutional amendments that gave people the right to vote? It is because often when it comes to the black experience, laws don't often matter. Right, right now you're hearing a lot of discussion about voter suppression, right? How in some states and in some counties and some minority areas, they have removed polling locations, all right? Just completely removed them. And experts are saying, make it difficult for people to exercise the right to vote. So what I wanna emphasize is that just because a law is passed, it doesn't mean the practice has stopped, all right? And, and, and as we go for the next four or five weeks, we will see this become a pattern over and over. And MLK said it best. He said, all black folk have ever wanted was for the US to be true to what it put on paper. And so when people say, well, Dr. Moore, it seems like black folk complain a lot, blah, blah, blah. And I go back to that quote, just be true to what you put on paper, all right? We'll take a couple of questions and we'll, and we'll shut it down right there. And Dr. Moore, I'm going to ask you more generic questions now. Okay. Um, first, uh, very beginning, someone asked, somebody was curious about your professorship. Mm -hmm. Can you tell us a little bit? Because that's, uh, that's always a, a good topic to discuss. All right, here we go. So George Littlefield, um, he has the Littlefield Fountain. Uh, the Littlefield money put up a lot of the, I believe, a lot of the Confederate statues. Uh, so yes, my professorship is named after someone who was directly involved in slaveholding interests, all right? I don't run from that, I'm, I'm honest about it, you know, and, and it was funny when they were uh, deciding what professorships, professorship to give me, Dr. Gordon thought it was a good idea that I had the Littlefield professorship. He said Littlefield may be, may be turning over in his grave knowing that this, you know, this black professor who teaches black history, you know, has a professorship with his name on it. Mm -hmm. uh, an interesting question. I haven't thought of, uh, have you received pushback for teaching this class uh, from the community? Mm, I, don't, I don't think so. Uh, I don't think so. I mean, you know, I love teaching. You know, I've always wanted to teach Black history to the masses. So this has given me an opportunity to do that. And also it's given me a run through for what, you know, it'll be like uh, teaching online to my students in the fall. Um, going back to the topic, you talked about freed slaves, buildings, homes, and schools uh, with the recension of 40 acres and a mule. How are they acquired the land and funds to build? Did many choose to go back to the field for a wage? What paid work was available? Well, some of them went and, and took over abandoned lands that had been abandoned, abandoned by Confederates. Some of them went and took over uh, uh, property, you know, that wasn't very arable where you couldn't, uh, you know, it, it was tough to grow stuff on but they were able to eke out. They were able to eke out in existence. Uh, sometimes they were able to purchase property after a year or two, but that was one thing they wanted. They wanted their own property. And sometimes they were given, they were given property as well. So they acquired land through a number, through a number of means. Uh, Joanna asked if you were gonna circle back to her question and I All can right. read it back, <laughs> read it again. Let's right. see. Um, in the 1619 article, President Lincoln said that he wasn't for slavery, but that he also wasn't for black equality. Do you think this sentiment is still held by the white and non-black Americans today? Uh, I hope, I hope not. You know, I mean, Lincoln was a very interesting figure. You know, you know, he, you know, he came up with an idea of maybe colonizing. Uh, you know, if, when black folks got emancipated, he talked about the idea of maybe sending them to Africa, or some other place. Uh, but I think, you know, Lincoln is a very, is a contradictory figure. You know, he's a product of his time, uh, but he's a very, very contradictory figure. So Joanna, I, I don't have a, uh, I don't have an answer to that one, Joanna, but thanks, you, thanks for the thought provoking uh, question. Uh, do you have an uh, opinion, because Patrick Patterson asked this question, opinion on reparations? Ha, yeah. 
Uh, you know, and I'm probably more pessimistic about reparation than anybody. You know, and I tell people, you know, if <laughs> if you can't even get uh, black folk hired as football coaches and uh, the coach women's basketball team, that you're making a big jump thinking that, you know, I believe, I believe thinking that America will come up with some form of cash payment uh, to African-Americans. So I'm, I'm a little pessimistic about that, but there's some great debates going on. And I know the Congressman from Detroit, uh, John Conyers, uh, prior to his death, every 40 years, you know, he introduced a reparations bill, uh, reparations bill in Congress, but the debates are fascinating uh, nonetheless. Uh, uh, you mentioned a couple of, uh, of uh, examples, but are there any other films you would recommend related to today's lecture specifically? Uh, I like 12 Years a Slave. Sankofa is a very, very popular film. Uh, that's, a, that's, that's a good one as well. Um, uh, now, I understand some, some will be problematic, more problematic than others. Uh, but I think, you know, just, you know, just, 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 you know, watching a, a film or two just to see what the experience was like. I really like 12 Years a Slave. I, I think that was phenomenally done. I think it's uh, historically accurate. Uh, I, I would kind of start there and then just, you know, you get on Google and just, you know, see where your interests uh, take you. Uh, did Freeman communities emerge at this time post-Civil War that you may be yes. discussing this in your next class, but, and how are they connected uh, to the land allocation you've been discussing? Well, you have some freedmen communities in Austin, Texas right now. And ironically, some of the most prominent freedmen communities were in West Austin. Many of y'all, I don't know if y'all know Stephanie Lang, but she does an awesome tour. She works in DDC, used to work in Black Studies. She does an awesome tour of these freedmen communities around Austin, Texas, and how several of them were in West wealthy white West Austin, like west of Mopac, you know? Terrytown area. So she does an amazing tour of that. But yes, these you had one Freedman community, uh, uh, South Austin, several in West Austin. Uh, you have a couple right on the verge of uh, downtown. Oh, you have a couple right on the verge of sort of downtown Austin on the east side of Mopac. But it is a phenomenal tour. But yes, we're talking about communities that were established right after the Civil War. Um, from, oh, I just passed it, but. Uh... Keflin Brown's um, child, why were the laws put in place? A sixth grader is asking this. Why were the laws put in place in the US through the constitution not applied to black people? Why are we still waiting for the country to do what it puts on paper? Ooh, that sounds like the child of a professor, huh? Uh, <laughs> that, that, you know, that is a good, that is a great question. Um, the constitution, you know, uh, even now people say it never, it never applied to black people, all right? Uh, understand, folks, his, history is ugly. History is ugly. But what I do like, and I want to speak to uh, the, 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 the sixth graders' question, um, is that we have people who are fighting to make it a better place. You know, I tell people every social movement we have had in America is largely about making America a better place. You know, I am proud that we can have debates, you know, that we can have rallies, you know, having spent a lot of time in communist China taking students there where. You know, we are told in orientation, there are some subjects you just can't talk about. You know, I am glad that we live in a place where we can, you know, we can have these debates and have these social movements to make America a better place, you know, for you um, as you enter your sixth grade year. Okay. We'll take one more, Helen. Uh, yes. Uh, let's see. So many questions, Dr. Moore. They're all wanting to have answers. Okay. Um, a couple more. I, I want to get people yeah. A few minutes back, so go ahead. <laughs> okay. Um, when I lived in Birmingham, Alabama, someone told me that the Civil War was about states' rights, and that was the truth because he learned it from history books. How do we overcome this kind of learning? Well, one of the amazing things I think former Confederates did was this whole idea of the lost cause movement. We'll talk about this next week, right? Understand. Uh, uh, the Confederate statues don't get put up until the early 1900s, like 1910, 1914, 15, as these Confederate um, veterans are beginning to die off. That is the first wave you see of Confederate statues going up. And this was a part of this lost cause mythology where 
they decided, no, the war wasn't about slavery. The war was about preserving our way of life. Uh, and we didn't lose the war. We were just, uh, we were just sort of defeated. And it was about states' rights. It's about you know, us you know, fighting off Northern aggression. And so the Confederate statue piece in this lost cause narrative, right? It's what explains why you not only have Confederate statues in Southern states, there was an article that came out last week talking about how many Confederate memorials there are in Northern states, all right? So they, the, 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 I think it was the Daughters of the Confederacy or something like that, were very good at going all throughout the country, getting Confederate memorials placed up. So the first phase you see the statues going up is when these Confederate um, veterans are beginning to die. The second time you see them going up and where you begin to see now the Confederate flag is in the aftermath of the 1954 Brown versus Board of Education decision. And I argue that decision in 1954, Brown versus Board of Education is what ushered in an anti-government uh, anti sentiment uh, amongst many people across America, primarily in, uh, in the white South, all right? Um, and so understand the daughters of daughters of the Confederacy, I think that's what it was called, but they did a good job of changing this narrative, right? To say, no, it was the lost cause, states rights, preserving our way of life. It had nothing to do with slavery. And that's when you see the whole narrative around the civil war uh, begin to change. Um, Dr. Moore, during reconstruction, it seems that a number of middle-class African-Americans rose to positions of power in their communities in the South. Mm -hmm. How are these middle-class African-American pockets established prior to emancipation during slavery? Well, you had a small free black population um, uh, in the South, very, very small free black population in the South before, uh, before slavery was over. Uh, some people were with pseudo carpet bags. They went South after the war. But understand this, they were only in political office for a short period of time. And we'll talk about that next week. For four or five years are they in political office. Um, you know, when Reconstruction is over and when Jim Crow was put in place, the, the white Northerners basically told white Southerners, we will never interfere in your race problems again. And you can argue that from 1877, roughly to 1954, or even 1964, uh, the American government, white Northerners, stayed out of white Southerners' race issues in the South. They, they let them alone. You know, we, we fought that fight. If that's how you want to deal with Black folks, go ahead. We will not intrude. We will not get in the way. Um, you talked a little bit about this, but what is the link between 40 acres and sharecropping enslavement? Well, can we get to sharecropping next week? Next sharecropping week, okay. will be a system of perpetual indebtedness. You were back on the plantation working for a share of the crop, meaning uh, the landowner lets me live there. I may work 20, 30, 40 acres for the landowner. And the way the arrangement works, I get all my tools, all my equipment, all my uh seed and all agricultural stuff. I get everything from the landowner and the landowner just keeps a ledger. And at the end of the year, when the crop comes in and I take the crop in, that is when me and the owner will settle up. But if the owner is the one keeping the books, if the owner is the one, you're going to get your groceries from there, you get your, um, your, 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 your all your uh, farm implements from there. It was a system that always kept black people in debt. And in the South, you could not leave if you owed somebody money. So what you have are families as sharecroppers for 15 to 20 years, all right? And, they, and, and owners say, well, uh, maybe you'll do better next year, but what, no matter how much I grew or how valuable it was, I always came up short, which forced me to stay there another year and work. So it was a form of perpetual indebtedness. Uh, how does the black, how does the experience of Africans, black Latinos, black Caribbeans affect the American black experience? You know, there is a big debate in, in woke circles now, and I'm gonna see if I can get this right. There's a debate, um, uh, uh, one group is called, I think the American descendants of slaves. Some of y'all may know this better than I do, so if I'm wrong, correct me. 
um, the American descendants of slaves and another group is called something else. But what they argue in terms of the reparations debate, and this is pretty vicious, what they argue in terms of the reparations debate is that immigrants from Africa and that folk from the Caribbean should not be included in that group. They are making a clear distinction. Um, the descendants of enslaved Africans are in a separate category by themselves. Now they do consider them a part of the diaspora, but in terms of the reparations debate, they would argue that immigrants from Africa and immigrants from the Caribbean should not be uh, a, a part of the reparations debate because they didn't go through the horrors of slavery uh, in America. Uh, lots of questions about, uh, um, about what things they could have uh, or what tools and resources uh, they can, and we can also share the resources uh, yeah. via chat and what you had mentioned in the lecture. But um, you know, many questions about kids. You know, what are when when did you start talking to your kids about slavery in American history? When they were like two. <laughs> <laughs> you know, I have it's the, I have a kindergartner that talked and asked a lot of questions, and I'm worried what she's learning in AISD and how similar it is to what I learned. Yeah, I mean, I think, I mean, I mean. As a parent or a guardian, you, you probably know what's that, what your child can and cannot handle. But I don't think we do our kids any disservice when we withhold this information from them. I really believe that if kids are taught this at a young age, at a young age, um, then our society can be a lot better. Part of the problem is a lot of Americans have not been exposed to Black history at all. So if the first time you're being hit with this, you're 30, you're 40, you're 50, you know, it's, it's kind of hard to digest, but I really believe black history should be taught uh, in pre-K and, and bring it all the way up. Are you aware of any historians currently documenting our current events and our movement right now that you would sure. recommend? You know, one thing, you know, you know, I mean, you got a lot of people doing a lot of video stuff and, and I think we're living through a very uh, amazing moment. And let me say this about, about Black Lives Matter. Let, let me say this. Because some people talk about, well, Black Lives Matter is, a, is an organization funded by white people. When most people use the term Black Lives Matter, they're talking about, I would say, a movement. Okay, so when the civil rights movement was going on, Fannie Lou Hamer, Ella Baker, people like that, they didn't say this is the civil rights movement. They just say, no, we're having a voting campaign, a voter campaign in Lauderdale, Mississippi next week. All right. So, so oftentimes we get caught up on this terminology but it just implies that there is a movement. Uh, so I look at this as sort of the Black Lives Matter movement that in many ways has, you know, has, spread, has spread globally. The interview, I don't know if any of you all watch Premier League soccer, but I was watching, you know, I was watching, a, uh, I think a, a game a week ago, so ago, and every Premier League team has Black Lives Matter on the back of their jerseys, and they were kneeling at, at the beginning of each game uh, in honor of um, uh, the murder of, of George Floyd. So this is something that this movement started by, this hashtag started by, you know, three African-American women, women that has gone global. And it is exciting when you see just how far uh, the ripple effects, uh, how, how, it's, how it's spread globally. Well, uh, there's many questions, but I, I think the time is coming. Yeah. So I, I'll say one last question because I think you'll enjoy this one. If you are, right. a if you're pessimistic about reparations, what do you consider a realistic alternative? Uh, I don't know, to be honest. I, I mean, I don't know. It's, um, I don't know what a realistic, I don't, I mean, that, that is a good question. Um, you know, that's, that's a question I, li I literally don't, I don't, I don't have, I don't have the answer for. Now, there are some people who would argue, um, some people, woke folk, who argue against reparations because they feel any cash payment, right, would just be spent with white business owners. I mean, I've, seen, I've heard several people make that argument. So some people talk about, um, you know, free tuition. Some people talk about uh, a free house. And when we start talking about how did government create white suburbs and how if you were a veteran or if you were white and you wanted to move to the suburb, all you needed was like a dollar down. And when we talk about that, um, there may be some, I think some people begin to argue about maybe, you know, um, uh, uh, you know, no money down, home loans and things of that nature. So we'll just see what happens. But let me say this as we close, folks, this is a lot of fun for me. 
you know, I like the engagement, you know, I mean, I've been wanting to take Black History to the masses uh, for a long time. And thank you all for, you know, for checking us out. Uh, stay safe, wear a mask this weekend. Uh, Barton Creek is closed, so you may want to stay around the house and we'll uh, catch up with you all next week. Thank you so much for, for, uh, for joining us today. All right, thank you. Thank you, Dr. Moore. Uh, we'll keep the chat going for a little bit longer because um, it's, it's going strong. Um, okay. And thank you all for submitting questions. Um, the demand was high, so we could only get to, to I think, uh, 50 or 60 questions versus I think there was about 100 or so more okay. to go. So okay. um, thank you all. Um, we'll, as you can see uh, on the screen, uh, we next week's reading is up there and you all, I believe, should have the syllabus. If not, please contact us and we'll send you um, uh, the link to the syllabus. And I believe it's also in the chat room space as well. Thank you, please stay safe and um, we will see you next week. All right. Thanks, 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 Dean. Appreciate it.